obviously there's a lot of areas to be concerned, of course, and need to be discussed. But the good part is AI can really uh, be an amplifier of our human capabilities. We have a personal agent that can give us some of that information to help us be more productive. Welcome to the Curious Advantage podcast, an exploration of the idea of curiosity and its increasing importance for thriving in the digital age from the authors of The Curious Advantage. My name is Paul Ashcroft. I'm one of the co-authors of the book, The Curious Advantage. And today I'm here with my co-authors, Simon Brown. Hi there. And Garrick Jones. Hello. And we're delighted to be joined by Mike Vaughan. Hi, Mike. Hello there. Mike, as our listeners are about to discover, you're into the worlds of artificial intelligence, neuroscience, and learning. All three. Tell us a little bit about how you got into those areas, please. Well, certainly, yeah. It it has been quite a journey. So for the last 20 plus years, um, I guess you could say I've been following the neural pathways. It uh, started out with AI. uh, So I was a developer. And uh, I was working with uh, the early neural networks, which are kind of the core of what you find in uh, large language models like ChatGPT. And uh, I was just uh, really trying to understand how to use AI back then. And uh, our, our claim to fame back then was that we took one of those dot matrix printers, if you can remember those, and we actually trained it to balance a pole. So we mounted a pole on top of the printer head and then gave it positive and negative reinforcement, just like you would balance a pole in your hand. We tried to teach it to balance a pole. Now, no one really needed a printer that balanced a pole. And (laughs) and, uh, so that led me to the next uh, path in my life of uh, still following the neural pathways, if you will, into neuroscience. And uh, what I was curious about was uh, how do we uh, expose our mental models? And more importantly, how do we change our mental models? And then that, of course, led me into the learning and development space. And now that has been a career of trying to develop learning, which gets people to think about their thinking and explore new, more productive ways of thinking. And uh, I'm guessing that your phone has probably been ringing off the hook over the last few weeks, Mike. Um, So I know uh, I've been uh, geeking out around the world of AI and trying to learn as much as I can as, as quickly as possible. You seem to be right in the sweet spot of, of learning neuro pathways and AI. So um, yeah, what what's the last few weeks looked like for you? Yeah, my goodness, it, it has been. I, I don't think there's a day that has gone by that I haven't had uh, extensive conversations about the impacts that AI is having, uh, specifically in L&D, but just in general, you know, everything from impacts and ethics. Obviously, a a lot of reports were released this week about the number of jobs that are going to be impacted. There's obviously different perspectives of people saying we need to slow down uh, the release of AI tools, while others are saying, hey, let's just speed it up so we can learn more and be able to figure out how how they're working. So uh, yeah, it has been uh, exciting. And it's also been a fire hose too. Like Much like you, I've been trying to consume as much as I can as well. I've got the basic question, Mike, which is, um, how is AI impacting learning and how is learning and will learning be changed by all of these new apps and all of these new tools that we've been given? Yeah, I I wrote a prediction article uh, a few months ago. And of the 10 predictions that I put out there, the one that is the most popular, that, uh, that I get the most calls around, is around content is no longer king experiences. Amazing. And the subtitle of all of that is that our belief is AI and you know with the 200 tools that just came out in the last quarter, that's gonna exponentially increase the next few quarters uh, to a point where AI is getting good enough where it's gonna generate e-learning, just-in-time learning, in the flow of work learning. And so they're the, where all these organizations have really built their business around content, that's going to be democratized. And now the focus is going to be more on how do you create experiences that challenge people to think about their thinking, to give them a chance to practice, to be able to see the impacts of their decisions. And so I think that's why that particular one uh, has gained so much traction. So, so many questions that I could ask you. But, um, I think first one sort of building on that of content is no longer king. So I've seen a few things that are 
offering up a glimpse of maybe the future around this. So um, Sal Khan at Khan Academy has released the um, example of the ChatGPT for Tutor, where they have integrated a, a tutor function into ChatGPT4. So it acts as though it's a, a caring teacher who will help a student through with what they're struggling with. It won't come in straight away and give the answer. That gives a little glimpse, I guess, of, of one element of, of what the future could look like. I had another example where on one of the podcasts I've been listening to where someone said, um, teach me about uh, inflation. And it like whipped together a sort of whole program on inflation with um, uh, assessments and questions to query your knowledge and, and all of these from assessment essentially a single prompt. So what's your thoughts on, you know, is is this the end of content and we'll start to learn from um, in, interacting with a with an AI in the future or where do you see it going? Wow, that's a, that's a good question. And uh, yeah, I love what uh, Khan Academy has done. They got an early release of uh, ChatGPT4 and uh, it is it is impressive um, yeah. of what it's uh, capable of doing. You asked the question is, you know, is, What's going to happen with content? Is it going to go away? I don't think so. I think it's we're just going to have to think about content differently. And it's it's like the biggest challenge L and D is going to have is that everyone in the organization is going to become content creators and content uh, you know, or prompt engineers, if you will. And so they're going to start creating content. And so it, I think what's going to have to happen is we're going to have to think about content, content creation, content distribution very differently which then allows us to then hopefully create space to actually think about better learning experiences. So if people can get the content they need to do, you know, how understand the processes, methodologies, procedures, and so forth, well, then let's focus our energy on providing that next level of learning experience where they can practice it. So uh, I guess that also then raises a question, which is one of the criticisms we've had around um, GPT and, and some of the others around truth. So if we're all generating content, what can we trust in that content, particularly if it's being fed by not just what the, the user is doing? So we have user generated content today, and I guess there's a, a bit of a trust element, but actually if the user is generating the content by using an AI to trawl wherever to do that, all sorts of implications on trust and truth and, and so forth. How do you see that uh, playing out? Yeah, that's, that's a very good one because uh, we, we're actually trying to focus on that uh, quite a bit. We actually just released a new tool this week, only internal uh, MVP, so not to the public, that allows an organization to create their own private AI database, basically, their own la large language model. And so why is that important is because each organization has content that is proprietary, that should stay within the boundaries of that organization, that is your own unique value that you bring out and shouldn't be known outside the organization. And so being able to have that in these uh, tools that can produce uh, courses using the content, that's the first area that we're focused on. The second is sourcing the materials that it generates. So one of the things that we've been working on is as it generates the response, we give all the sources of where that content came from, which I think is another element in gaining uh, trust in the AI. We talk about um, critical thinking, and um, it's very difficult to teach the next generation to be critical and to understand their own biases. Uh, you, you know, we've got to have that as well. But I think, uh, as you are saying, we need to have the trust element built within the systems that we're using or the arch languages that we are um, deploying. And and you, what you're saying is almost behind the firewall, the proprietary knowledge is king once again. So it sort of comes back inside. I'm fascinated by all of this and how it links to learning in the flow of work. Can you mention that earlier? You know, we're inside our organization or inside our lives, and we're rapidly moving to a place where the technology is going to be able to flow information to us in a just-in-time, contextually relevant manner. And now we have the tools who are able to scrape that information and bring it back in meaningful ways. You know, as you were talking about, Simon was talking about like putting together a whole course just in time as required from what a single prompt. What do you think about the, the learning and the flow of the work and the context stuff and how, how the AI tools are going to help us get there? Well, I, I actually loved how you explained it. I, I think you hit it right on the head there. The only thing I would add is that I think what we'll start to see is a um, evolution of personal AI agents. 
So, you know, Garrick, you will have an AI agent that will get to know you. It will get to know uh, what you're interested in, how you learn, how you like that content presented, how much content you want presented. Do you want it uh, presented to you in the morning? You know, uh, do you want it uh, bulleted in the morning and then an extensive you know, write up on the weekend for you? Find me a companion who knows me. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah, I get, we could all probably benefit from that. That's right. I love that. So uh, we all get the benefit of being able to tailor our learning and our knowledge and our feeds in a way that suits our own preferences, our own life. That sounds, sounds incredible. And that's the part that gets me excited about AI. Obviously, there's a lot of areas to be concerned, of course, and, and need to be discussed. But the good part is AI can really uh, be an amplifier of our human capabilities. And I think that's awesome if we have a personal agent that can give us some of that information to help us be uh, more productive in uh, that day. I was wondering if you had a point of view on, we just read this week that, that a group of scientists and AI practitioners have kind of asked governments to just slow down and stop for a moment, because we're in a position where now code is creating code. And um, I know that it, that was put before the British government, who at this point in time are, are not <laughs> really signing up to anything. They're just letting a free flow of stuff. What's going on there? Yeah, I, I find that really interesting because a number of, I would say, very big players, you know, everything, everyone from like an Elon Musk is uh, basically saying, hey, let's take a six month pause to really think through what's going on. Now, do I think that will happen? I highly doubt it. In my impression, the train has left the station and there's huge momentum. And if anything, I think the number of tools will come out. What I do love is that they are challenging us to think about this and to be those critical thinkers. And they're asking the hard questions now. And um, Simon and I were just sharing that we just watched this uh, podcast with Lex um, Friedman and uh, uh, Sam Altman, and he was thinking about uh, these very issues. And I think the point that I did like that he made is that we need to release it now. Well, it's really simple technology. It really is. It's kind of simple today. It will become much more sophisticated in a year, two years, three years from now. So it is probably in our best interest to have it rolling out like it is, learning the implications and challenges, working together to improve the underlying technology. And so then we're all kind of ready for it in two to three years from now. If we were just to you know, surprise everyone, I think that would be even worse. It's super interesting because um, literally in the last few hours in this time where we're talking now, but um, Italy have just uh, announced that they are banning ChatGPT as a country. Oh, I did not hear it. I don't know how they're doing that. I don't know what it is, but there was a, a news headline a couple of hours ago saying a you know, country of Italy is, is banning ChatGPT from a, a data privacy perspective is the, the reason that they're giving. But um, that's super interesting that it's now you know, re reached that point where we're getting a, a country saying, no, we don't want to do it. I've, I've heard that from companies where individual companies are saying, we, we don't want anyone to use this, but to have a whole country do that is fascinating. <laughs> I did not hear about that. And that is fascinating. I, I, I can kind of get a company, you know, I've been thinking about all the ethical implications, you know, everything from privacy, security, and uh, even job loss and so forth. The thing that has me uh, most intrigued or where I spend some time thinking about is how do we equip the L&D professionals to, with good judgment? And so take, for example, you're an instructional designer. Uh, one of the business leaders come to you and say, hey, listen, we need our teams to really understand our strategy and understand how they're impacting our strategy. And can you put together a course and uh, just get that out in the next two weeks? So then the instructional designer uh, takes, you know, some of the strategy documents and says, geez, I need to move quickly. I got to get this out, submits that to ChatGPT to summarize. And all of a sudden now your proprietary information is outside the firm. Yeah. So the intent was great. The person wanted to move quickly. They wanted to put, you know, summarize it so people can digest it. And so the intent is great. But now they've just made the organizational strategy uh, known outside the firm. So those, I think, are going to be some of the initial challenges L&D is going to need to uh, think through.
And as we're building the skills, it's going to be as important that we're informing and educating uh, around the the trust, the privacy, the uh, ethics uh, aspects of this, uh, as much as the, the skills to use, um, I think is going to be have have to go absolutely hand in hand to uh, to be able to make well, for organisations anyway to be able to make effective use of the tools. And Mike, to come in on this, so something that's fascinating me at the moment is the new business models that AI is is likely to present, and genuinely new business models that w- we've been talking about. How you know. Uber is effectively a new business model that's, at least in my mind, mainly enabled by location-based protocols with it on the mobile phone, and people are carrying a mobile phone. So you can design a business model because basically you know where your customer is and that the person that is trying to find them can navigate, even if they have no knowledge of the environment in which they're living in. Um, you don't have to do in London the knowledge to learn the, the maps of London. You can look at your, um, you can look at your phone. So have you given some thought to what do you think some of the genuinely new business models um, that might emerge are, especially thinking about, as you say, the where data is sitting now and how we're essentially using other companies' data to provide a better service to the customers that we're working with? Yeah, well, the, the initial impact, or I guess the, the, around the business model is around you're now paying for words or tokens. And uh, that is such an interesting idea. You know, it's just like, wow, yeah, you're, as you're generating content, you're paying for each of those words. I have to jump in, Mike. The last time we paid for words was when um, we had the invention of the printing press. And printers in London, of course, you know, the, the, the market of markets, <laughs> and also Germany, used to be paid for each word on the page. But not only that, they then got into be paying for the length of the words on the on the page, and um, <laughs> that led to curious spellings in English, like why we have the silent e, and why we have a ph, which and, and things that are unpronounced in in some of our spelling. It came completely out of being paid for words. And why the Count of Monte Cristo is a thousand pages long. <laughs> <laughs> that is fascinating. We are talking with Mike Vaughan. Mike is the CEO of the Regis Company an award-winning, globally recognized leader in simulation design, serving Fortune 500 companies worldwide. Mike champions Regis's mission to make simulations affordable and scalable for all organizations and envisions a future where simulation-based learning is available in schools worldwide. So companies like ours that are leveraging the AI tools, what we're excited about is that there are more large language models coming out, you know, and so with Google Bard, you know, Meta releasing Lambda and so forth, and and then other services that are being stood up to allow people to build more models. Uh, we like that because we're anticipating that'll keep the cost per word down and reasonable. Uh, so that's what we've been looking at. Uh, but as far as kind of the new business models too, I'm not sure what's going to happen yet. It, it's with all these tools coming out as fast as they are, I think people are going to be a little apprehensive to invest too much too quickly. And so I think it's going to get more bloody first, meaning a lot of tool vendors are going to go out of business and replaced by new ones. And uh, then it'll finally slow down after a year. And then I think we'll see some other business models evolve. But Paul, I haven't thought enough that far forward. Um, if you have an opinion on it, I'd love to hear I that. think nobody knows. As you say, I'm challenging my son, who's 14, every every week to what would what's the game changing ai business model because guaranteed some kid is going to come up with something before they're 18 and make a billion out of it that's true right? yeah it's amazing the whole change of how and how this changes the game so fast so quickly how people will be able to get into experiential you, you talked about experiential learning uh, and that's how it all links with learning flowing in, into work at the point that we need it. What, what about VR? And by experiential, do you mean only VR? Are there things beyond VR? Is this an AI and VR matchup? Um, yeah, so the VR and AR is not an area of expertise for me. And so when I'm talking about the experiential learning, I'm talking about simulations that are through the browser that are uh, situational, meaning that it is delivering a challenge that is very contextual to your job and it is asking you to make a decision, and then it is giving you feedback on that decision and helping you think more systemically and help you think about how would you uh, approach that situation differently. So that's what I'm talking about experiential learning. 
Um, I think the VR and AR will start to benefit from AI as well. I just feel like it's still a little early for those to have kind of large scale adoption due to mainly price and scalability issues. And what's the most impressive use of AI that you've seen just generally? What's the thing that blew your mind? Well, I don't know if it's fair to share my own bias here, but uh, something our team released this week, it was a one-click simulation. It, uh, you, I fed it a prompt of uh, what skills, then I told it what industry, and then I told it the type of leader, like an empathic leader versus a directive leader. And then I said, uh, build a sim, and it built a three-round simulation with uh, scenarios in each round. And then I went and read the content in each of those scenarios. And I would hypothesize that it was about 70, 80% really solid content. Wow. What skill was that uh, building out of interest? Uh, the one that I ran, I think I did strategic thinking for technology with an empathic leader and a directive leader. And that's uh, then it just went out and generated the content. Wow. <laughs> yeah, it, it blew me away too, actually. <laughs> yeah. Mike, you, you're hinting at it, but you, you mean you're CEO of the Regis company. And if you don't mind me saying, you're, you're an award winning leader in simulation design. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit more about you know, what are you really focusing on at the moment and what's getting you most excited in the work that you're doing? Oh, well, th yeah, thank you, Paul. And I appreciate that. Um, What's getting us most excited is simulations and experiential learning have obviously been around for 20 plus years. Uh, the problem is that we call it the four fears, is that they've cost too much to build, they've taken too long to build, they've been too complex to deliver, uh, they've been really challenging to maintain and keep updated uh, with the, the how fast things are moving. And we released a new platform that addresses those four fears to a point where we want to get to the end of this year where people would say, why would I even build a learning course when I can build a simulation for the same cost and can make it more scalable and make it team-based? And so that's what has us excited is that um, we're finally bringing to market what we consider is the best type of learning experience, the experiential learning, simulation-based learning uh, that is uh, not only affordable, but highly scalable. So tell me more on the team-based element of that. So how, how would that work? Yeah, so this is uh, an area of focus of ours right now. So we're focused really on two things, AI and team-based learning. And so most of the clients out there are still predominantly uh, do doing training online. And so whether it's through a Zoom or any of those uh, online types of tools, the challenge has been, well, we like to put people in a breakout, but every time we put them in a breakout, we try to give them provocative questions or an activity, but that usually means it's coffee break and people take off. And uh, what they rather have is let's put people in a breakout and let's have a simulation in that breakout in which the three or four people are going through the sim a round of a simulation and learning from each other, hearing each other's perspectives making decisions. And then all those decisions are captured and then brought up to a facilitator who then can then facilitate a plenary uh, with all the data from all the different teams and hearing all their different perspectives. We believe that changes the entire online experience and it makes it more team-based and cohort-based, which is also, we believe, is really powerful. In other words, you're blending kind of the power of online learning with the power of in-person learning. And within that, are you also taking advantage of things like some of the, the breakthroughs I've seen in AI video as well, where you know, it's, it's creating either real time or um, uh, personalized video, I guess, as well, or, or is that future roadmap type uh, elements as well? Yeah. So uh, what we're leveraging today is uh, in the authoring tool, you can build uh, avatars by just providing it content and within let's say two to five minutes, it generates a uh, avatar that will speak that script. We're now introducing that into kind of video branching, conversational branching, so it's more robust. And then in the future, I think what we'll see is leveraging that more real time where it generates it on the fly. Right now, it's not fast enough uh, to incorporate in, into that end user experience. 
uh, the time in the past spent trying to create branching scenarios and uh, video behind branching scenarios in a way that could be maintained and personalized was it used to be yeah hundreds of thousands of dollars and and a, and a nightmare to, uh, to to maintain and you could only take it so far whereas if that can all be yeah spun up super easily with ah, it's very exciting <laughs> yes, and that that exists today to be able to do a video branching with avatars it's uh it's pretty intuitive and pretty sim- uh, fast to build it's just going to have a huge impact on on the learning industry and all of those large content providers you know the the dreams of the netflix of of learning all of that seems to be now in question we will always need content, but people will need content inside their organizations, as you said. But this whole provision of learning and property is going to change then massively, especially if things are being pulled together by the by the tools in this way. Yeah, when I uh, mentioned earlier, I uh, wrote that predictions document. One of the other predictions I wrote in there was the days of uh, large catalogs are numbered. Yeah, and um, you know the thought was that well, just going and paying for these large e-learning catalogs is probably going to be challenged. You know, so if you think of about some of the bigger ones like a LinkedIn Learning, Udemy, and so forth, um, my guess is they're going to have to start even think, rethinking their own business model and rethinking their own content strategy. Mike, you mentioned earlier about you imagine that we will have a personal companion that works alongside us. Um, we see this with Microsoft Copilot. Right, as maybe an early, early example of that, and and also you talked about how AI is going to add to our ability. What's it taking away, and what does, what do you think this means for the things that we need to learn? You know, we're asking people. I mean, even on this podcast, there's an entirely new large language set that we are even tokens, parameters, the the whole different new language that comes with AI. What do you think this means in terms of? the skills that we need to learn to be successful in the near term with this? The one skill that I'm really excited about is learning to ask better questions. You know, so the best way to expose our own mental models, the best way to advance and improve upon our mental models is by framing a question that challenges us to think about our own thinking. And the better the question, the better our, the brain responds. And I, I see that also very much in kind of, let's take the chat GPT world, uh, the prompt engineering, where if you ask, if you understand how to ask it a good question, you understand kind of the, the clause and the, the subject and the, the modifiers and where to put those, you get a better result. And so I think one of the first jobs, there's actually several already, that AI is creating or has already created is the first ones around uh, prompt engineering and then prompt chaining, which is after you've asked one good question and now you have kind of a a data set, how do you ask the next question, next question to get it distilled down to what what you're looking for? So in in many ways, I'm really excited about that. One of the most exciting things I heard about a month ago was a professor who responded to the rest of the professors and saying, okay, we know our kids are going to use the chat GPT. We know they're going to write the essays. And he said, so I'm going to make it mandatory that they have to use it. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to focus on what were the prompts that they used? What were the follow-up prompts? I'm going to look at the types of question and critical thinking that they did to produce that. And that's how I'm going to start uh, grading them. And that just blew me away. I was like, wow, that's some fresh thinking. So I, that got me excited. It's needed because it's going in the school's world and education, it's going to turn that upside down. And in particular, the examination boards, their work upside down. Because as, as you say, we're no longer necessarily going to be moderating the quality of an essay, but maybe critiquing an essay that has been generated online. Yes, and, we, and we're getting excited again about the quality of the questions that are being asked, the quality of the prompts and the prompt chaining from the learner which takes us all the way back to good old Socratic dialogue and the Aristotelian discourse. So, you know, so we come full circle by technology. You, you, you mentioned mental models, and I, I love the idea um, when you talk about how we grow and learn our mental models from the way we interact with this and how, and how we move forward as a result. And, and the mental models have come straight out of Peter Zengi work, of course, all those years ago. And I believe you have a link with Peter Zengi. 
could Peter have seen what was coming down the road? Maybe he did. But you know, he's kind of various orders of learning where you, you learn and then you become the, the passive learner and you become the, 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 the active learner and then you move into a learn to learn and learning how you, know, you move up those, up the ladder, if you like. Different orders of learning. What, how do you think this is all impacted on his work? Well, yeah, thank you. And actually, he was probably one of the greatest influences in, in my life in that um, uh, I was introduced to the fifth discipline early on, reached out to him, got connected, developed a relationship. And uh, I just uh, really appreciated that he, he was certainly a visionary in yeah. you know, systems thinking. And the, at the core of systems thinking is, you know, the idea of mental models and how to, and system thinking being a tool that helps you really expand your mental models. And uh, so that, that really did set me on my path. And so uh, have a, a tremendous amount of respect for all the forward thinking that he did. I, I think that type of research is now starting to come back again. I'm, I'm starting to see a lot of people talk about mindsets, mental models, and being able to help people learn new mental models and looking at different techniques. And obviously, neuroscience is a big area that people are tapping into right now. And so I do see that, uh, Garrick, that it's coming back. And I think his work around system thinking is probably more relevant now than probably ever before because of the interdependency and interconnectedness of the world. Yeah. And, you know, the people that really can bring a systems perspective are going to be more valuable. And if you think about the challenge of AI to humans, well, our ability to think systemically, our ability to be rational or to rationalize things, our ability to you know, be creative and have that curiosity, I mean, mm. you guys know better than anyone, is, is what sets us apart. And so what I'm hoping is that uh, people kind of get reinvigorated to become lifelong learners. And that was another uh, big topic that Peter Singe actually put out was the lifelong learner. You're listening to The Curious Advantage podcast, inspired by the book, The Curious Advantage, written by Paul Ashcroft, Simon Brown, and Garrick Jones. Subscribe to the podcast today. We love all of this stuff that helps us identify what are the big things we should be teaching, you know, Paul's son and the next generation. It's like, what, one of them obviously is prompt chaining and prompt engineering. Prompt engineering last night, I saw uh, first adverts for, uh, for prompt engineers. It was over $300,000 that was being offered for a prompt engineer. Now, I, I, I didn't go deep into it to see the, how, how genuine it was, but it was an article then. And that's in the art of why. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Go and do that tomorrow. It's. I mean, it's. It's incredible for our kids, though. That's. Uh, I mean, my my son's been playing around with. He's sixteen, and uh, he was testing the guardrails of it, um, as I guess sixteen-year-olds do. And uh, wasn't long before he'd uh, tricked it into giving him recipes for poisonous gas pipe bombs um, <laughs> and uh, how to. Uh, hack into someone's computer and uh, put something there that takes control. And uh, while there are guardrails there to uh, stop these things, those guardrails at the moment are pretty easily um, overcome. And yeah, to, to be fair to Sam Altman, that was seems to be the point of why he's putting it out there, because all of that information is available on the internet anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, and actually, now we can look at how we put the guardrails in. But uh, it's interesting to see kids' curiosity and uh, that, that they're very quickly learning how to use these tools to uh, to learn all manner of things through them. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It was um, was looking at this through the lens of our own uh, curiosity model. So uh, yeah, this is an area that uh, I think many people are going to be curious about as well as probably a, a bit scared about as well, which is understandable of both its impact and where it goes. And uh, so we have our seven C's model around context, community, curation, creativity, construction, criticality, and confidence. And I think mm. it applies super relevantly uh, into, into the world of AI because certainly I've been looking at it, of understanding the context, or there's a whole language that goes with this large language model, it's reinforcement learning with human feedback, um, you know, GPT, gen generative pre-trained transformers, all, all of these things that, that is you know, we didn't know about um, even many of us a few weeks ago. You know, th there's lots of people who are either like yourself, Mike, who are experts or, or others who are interested learners curation piece of how do we filter through what's real what's the noise what's what do we need to pay attention to 
what are the questions we need to bring through our own creativity and actually getting in and playing and, and putting that into action through construction, getting hands on, trying our own prompts, trying our own apps. I coded my first uh, game of Pong last night, um, which I've uh, never coded. But well, 20 years ago, I tried to learn to code and, uh, and, and now I had ChatGPT writing me the code for a game of Pong and then refining it, adding color and scoreboards. <laughs> uh, it's so actually get there, play it. And then we talked about criticality and then how that builds confidence confidence so i think there's a there's a nice model there if anyone's wondering how to uh, how to get started on all of this uh, have a look within the curious advantage book for the the model on how you can uh, apply curiosity to this oh that's brilliant i love that and i i be i have a question for all of you as experts in curiosity as you um, are seeing the growth in ai tools how do you think these tools will help enable people to become more curious how do you think it will expand their curiosity I'd be curious to get your opinion on that. Yeah, my my immediate reaction is I, I think it will make us question our own curiosity. And um, I sort of go on a little bit through that myself. You found yourself faced with a, a text empty text box and the ability to ask anything. <laughs> so it's where where will my curiosity take me? Yeah, so that, and I think it, it it's a great question. Actually, how how curious are we? And it builds then or gives the opportunity to then build our, our curiosity muscle that we can we can with with some fairly easy to learn skills around you know, prompts and figuring out how to structure questions we can get access to all manner of information that we we're curious about so i think it provides an incredible outlook for curiosity but i hmm. think then the criticality piece as we've talked a bit about becomes so so critical because that we can't take that the answers to our curiosity at face value because particularly in the early days what we're seeing may be completely made up maybe false maybe whatever so i think um learning again to ask questions and foster our curious muscle but then applying that criticality as to what we're seeing but mm -hmm. garrett paul what are your thoughts one of the things that prompted us to write the book mike was that we were concerned that the internet was such a narrow bandwidth especially for young people and for ourselves. You know, even though there's so much information there, getting access to it or living in it was still very narrow as compared to the natural world. And the thing about curiosity is it prompts us to keep things open and gives us tools to look far and wide as well as deep as we try to solve problems because there are infinite solutions in any given point in time. And uh, the thing about AI, which... You know, when it's done extremely well, and, and, and what I've been shown in the, in the last, literally the last month, gives me hope a lot because, I, you know, pulling together things, we, somebody pulled together a course, as you were saying, and, and we had a look at this, and that there were elements in the teaching of the course which were obviously best practice, and which there were things that I had no knowledge of at all. And so I was being informed because it was going wider than I could possibly ever have been. And mm -hmm. I find that every time we do a chat GPT, something or other, you, there are things in there you hadn't considered. And for me, if my, my infinite <laughs> and yet finite experience of, of my brain is the limit by which I can make and create, mm -hmm. uh, how brilliant to have a, a, a tool that actually goes, takes me further and beyond that. So um, for my curiosity, I mean, you know, I want to learn new things and that, that's helping. Mm -hmm. I would say, Mike, I love the question. I would say it's about, I think it might make us more confident. One of the things we talk about when we're talking about curiosity is having the confidence to get started with something. And, and often we don't. Often we don't get started because not just we're staring at an empty question box, as Simon said, but actually we might be just staring at a blank sheet of paper. We don't know where to start. So whether that's you need to write a new piece of code, uh, you need to frame and you know, a web page, you need to design a service, you need to build a business plan, you can ask, at least at the moment, one of these um, you know, generative models to give you the starting point. And actually, in a complete, you can ask it as many stupid questions as you like and probably won't get criticized personally for it. So you can give <laughs> things a go. You can be confident to get started because you don't then just have a blank sheet of paper. And then you learn with it as it's giving you more information. Mm. So I think it's going to be a boost to curiosity even if it's just giving us some of the scaffolding to be brave enough to go to go further. Mm, I love that. I love the point around confidence. Um, I was talking with my wife last night. She's a teacher, and we were talking about how noisy the world has become. And you know, you're just always glued to some type of social thing. And then 
the the art of stopping, going to something like ChatGPT, seeing that empty box, and then trying to just get started, typing in a question there. So Garrick used the word hope. It's like the hope is that people will go to these types of tools, type in things, mm -hmm. and then all to your point, that they will start to become more confident and maybe it'll allow them to pursue other things in life and you know, take on bigger challenges, which would be awesome. I'd, I'd love to know, Mike, what, um, what's keeping you curious at the moment? What are, what are you curious about? Yeah, well, um, gosh, I, probably just like all of you where each night, you know, jumping on and the internet and just reading or listening to all these podcasts and just trying to make sense of the AI and where it's going. And so I think the biggest thing that uh, keeps me excited is the potential impact AI will have on the learning development community. And what I'm curious about is uh, how it will be adopted, how it will be used, how it will accelerate design and development, and then ultimately how it will improve the learner experience. And so those are the areas that uh, really putting a lot of time into trying to understand and trying to get ahead of, so I can hopefully try to add value to other L&D professionals and giving them a little bit of a roadmap. So we've covered an awful lot over uh, the time. We're coming to an end. We, everything from balancing a pole on a dot matrix printer, <laughs> which uh, is an incredible way to start into the uh, the world of AI, through to some of your predictions, uh, how looking at you know, content may no longer be king in the future, discussion around just-in-time learning, talked about chat GPT for tutors, fascinated to see where organizations go to create their own um, large language models or be able to have uh, sort of closed uh, loops where, where uh, AI tools can start to learn. We got into personal AI agents and how uh, we may soon be personalizing them uh, to exactly what we, we want, where we might get our summarized bullets during the week, and then we get our long form things to uh, to read at the weekend. Uh, we touched on the, the pause that's being asked for on AI at the moment and some of the risks that are associated uh, around data privacy and beyond, uh, how we equip L&D professionals to take advantage of it and the need for, for ethics and good judgment. We went into uh, some of the costs associated of seeing the cost per word coming down. Uh, then we got into experiential learning uh, and some of the, the very cool stuff that Mike's company is doing around being able to create uh, simulations at uh, a single click, um, which is fascinating to see where that's going to go. And then also the impact on uh, on the learning community and uh, the learning world, uh, as well as a little dive into mental models along the way. So uh, fascinating conversation, Mike. That's a, that's a long list. Can you uh, add GPT and summarize it for us? Exactly. <laughs> Down to three, uh, three bullets. Yep. <laughs> yeah, there we go. <laughs> if there was one, uh, one takeaway from uh, all of that, Mike, anything that you would leave as, as one uh, final takeaway? You know, it, I think the final takeaway is um, it's really playing off, I think, the work that you all have already started around curiosity. And when I think about uh, the power of curiosity and the power of what these tools are gonna to allow is to enable and expand our, hopefully our curiosity. And why is that important? If you think about how do you improve a relationship, it's become more curious about the other person. How do you improve your skills? Become more of a curious learner. How do you improve um, in your, your job? You become more curious about ways you can improve upon it. Um, and so to me, that's at the root of all of this. And if this AI helps us all become more curious, I think it's exciting. It's very nice, uh, very nice thought to close. But I think we agree with you. It's a, uh, it's, it's an exciting time to be alive, Mike. When it comes to this, right at what seems to be the start of all it. Uh, Mike Vaughan, thank you so much for joining us. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. Likewise, I uh, appreciate your time. Thank you so much. You've been listening to a Curious Advantage podcast. This series is about how individuals and organisations use the power of curiosity to drive success in their lives and businesses especially in the context of our new digital reality. The Curious Advantage book is available on Amazon Worldwide. Order your physical, digital or audio book copy now to further explore the seven C's model for being more curious. We're curious to hear from you. We encourage you to write a review for the podcast on your preferred channel and join the conversation. Join today, hashtag Curious Advantage. Subscribe today and keep exploring curiously.
Thank you for listening to the Curious Advantage podcast. The Curious Advantage book is now available to purchase on Amazon. Stay tuned for the next episode and keep exploring curiously. This podcast is produced by Aliki Palinelli and John McGinty and edited by Jill Damatak-Futter. 